Students, counselors, families, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Uh, welcome to StriveScan's virtual college exploration program. This program is in partnership with the colleges that change lives. I have a few housekeeping items to cover before we jump into this presentation. First and foremost, you're encouraged to ask questions throughout the session via the Q&A button that you see on your screen. When you submit a question, it gets sent to our panelists and they will work to answer it during the session and at the conclusion of the session. Please know uh, this is, uh, there are your camera and your microphone are turned off. So the only way to submit questions is via the Q&A button that you see there. Our panelist is flying solo today. So make sure you send those questions in and they will get them at the conclusion of the session today. This is one of 50 individual information sessions and panel presentations being run through the colleges that change lives. I encourage you to go to strivescan.com slash virtual slash CTCL to see the recordings of past sessions and the upcoming sessions through this evening. And finally, when you signed up today, you received a barcode. You don't need that barcode for this virtual program. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Sam. All right, Zach, thank you so much. And a huge thank you to all of the students who are in attendance here this morning. I am thrilled to be with you to talk a little bit about our Sinus College um, as a part of this CTCL virtual presentation program. Um, so as Zach said, I'm Sam Carter, Associate Director of Admission at our Sinus. Let's get things underway. For those of you who don't know, Ursinus is a small residential liberal arts college. We have about 1,500 students on our campus, and those students are coming from 31 different states. We also have students joining us from DC, Puerto Rico, and 22 countries internationally. Um, obviously, as we are a part of this CTCL programming, we are indeed one of the 45 colleges that change lives. Um, and CTCL is a, an organization that's dedicated um, to the advancement and the support of a student-centered college search process. CTCL schools, or Sinus Chief among them, believe firmly in a student's need and desire to be put at the center of every single part of this research process. Um, so it's really about finding that school that's going to be the best fit for you. Um, that means a good fit inside of the classroom. That means a good fit outside of the classroom in the residence halls. And it also means a good fit before and after you join them on their campus community. Um, CTCL was founded on the philosophy of building knowledge, character, and values of young people, introducing them to that personalized and transformative collegiate experience. And we are so proud to still be putting that pursuit forward and at the forefront of what we're doing on our campus in our admission office. Ursinus has a chapter of Phi Beta Kappa. We are one of 10% of schools they're able to boast that honor society on our campus. Our students have gone on to garner Watson fellowships, Fulbright scholarships, and we even have a Rhodes Scholar amongst our alumni ranks. Academically, as we're a small college, we also encourage a small class size. So we have an 11 to one student to faculty ratio. Our average class size is 15. As such, we firmly encourage those student faculty relationships to grow those, to foster those, to cultivate those during your time on our campus. Um, you have uh, professors' cell phone numbers, you have their emails, you have open door policies on office hours. You're invited over to their homes um, for dinner throughout the semester and just to really build that relationship, cultivate that during your time on campus. They're also fantastic people to know as you're looking to move forward from our campus um, in terms of personalized recommendations. Um, they're able to connect you with their networks as well. They're obviously great people to know on our campus. They're great people to know after you leave our campus as well. We have over 60 different courses of study on our campus. 100% of our students will come in at least on paper as undecided. We believe that you should come in with an open mind. If you have an idea of what you might want to do, um, you can see some of our most popular majors right here. Maybe you come in thinking, yeah, I definitely want to be majoring in biology. That's completely fine. You can take those biology courses your first semester when you're on campus but we really want you to on paper at least be undecided as you explore and find out what it truly is that you're passionate about and then you're able to declare that major and pursue that track more formally at that point. To guide you through that decision making process, we have all of our students coming in as part of our cohort advising model. So we bring you in as a group to eight to 10 first year incoming students. You are required to check in as a group one time per week with your dedicated faculty advisor. And so this serves um, sort of two pursuits. The first is you have that faculty check-in. They're able to help you with that transition from high school into college, able to connect you with resources that we have available on campus. Um, maybe you come in, you're struggling on your first writing assignment. 
able to voice those concerns. It turns out four other students in your group are also having these same issues. You realize that I'm not alone. This is completely normal. This is part of that transition from high school into college. Your faculty advisor is able to connect you to the Institute for Student Success, um, where we house all of our free tutoring for students. So they're able to connect you with a writing tutor, they're able to get you back on track, and you're able to be successful in that class moving forward. So that's kind of the first um, benefit of that cohort advising model. The second is it gives you a social network. From day one on campus, you have eight to 10 other students that you know. You see them in the dining hall, you see them on the quad, it's a friendly face, a wave hello. And that social fabric is huge for our students, again, when they're making that transition into college, into that college life. When we instituted the cohorts and advising model, um, we saw our retention rate jump to over 90% from first to second year. It's hovered right around that level ever since. It's been hugely successful. Uh, and we're now going into, I believe, our fifth year of that successful cohort advising model. When you come in during that first year on our campus, um, you will enter into what we call the Your Sinus Quest Core Curriculum. Um, and really, at Your Sinus, we believe that education is a conversation. We believe that the best conversations begin with questions. And so we have four big ones for you as a first year incoming student. We have them listed right here. What should matter to me? How should we live together? How can we understand the world? And what will I do? Um, and we obviously don't expect you to have perfect answers to those questions. Um, but we do expect you to grapple with these four questions. And through that grappling, students are able to prepare themselves to live thoughtfully, live deliberately um, as both human beings, but also as citizens of their communities. And so through that common intellectual experience, it's a two semester course that all first year students are going to undergo. We're going to deal consistently with these four questions as a group. And the goal of that common intellectual experience is first, to cultivate what we call the self-knowledge necessary to live a considered life, an independent life, a responsible life. Um, the other goal is also to establish an intellectual community enjoyed by students and faculty alike. The common intellectual experience syllabus is identical across groups, but you might have yours taught by a neuroscience professor. That experience is going to be different than a student who has theirs taught by a dance faculty. But what will be common of the assignments are the questions are the readings, are the discussions taking place in those groups. And as such, we are, as an science community, able to speak a common language across all students and faculty. And so in your upper level courses, you'll have your faculty referring back um, to reading assignments, to writing assignments, to conversations that they know that you had as a first year incoming student to Rosinus. You'll be able to talk with upperclassmen about their experience because they went through those exact same things with you. We keep our CAE classes fairly small. It's limited to 16 students, which is right around our average class size of 15. Um, and we do this to provide an educational environment that's inducive uh, to intellectual challenge and intellectual discovery. We want you to be having these conversations. It's very much a discussion-based form of learning. It's also very writing intensive. And what CAE can do for you as well is help you figure out, okay, this is the level of output that was expected from me in my high school course. But now I'm here in college. This is what's going to be expected of me in an Ursinus classroom. And CIE is able to help you, again, make that transition, make that transition easier on you. And make it a shared transition that you're not going through alone. Every single one of your classmates, everyone in your residence halls will all be going through the same challenge together. We also believe that learning takes place outside of the classroom. And that's where we bring in our experiential learning project, the XLP. 100% of students are required to complete an XLP. Um, you can do it in one of the six modalities that we have uh, written here on the screen. The most popular for our students is internships. About 70% of our students are going to complete at least one internship, if not more, during their time on our campus. All of these internship opportunities are housed at our Center for Career and Postgraduate Development. And you'll walk into that office. I recommend you go in during your first semester, just introduce yourself, say hello, figure out the resources that are available for you. Um, and we don't necessarily pursue that internship right in your first semester. You can if you want to, but we find that students have more success in that first semester, most of the academics making that transition, and then pursuing an internship in that second semester if you would like to. They'll work with you on resume preparation, on interview preparation. They'll walk you through the application process. Um, and all of those are housed in a program that we have called Handshake, um, which is essentially LinkedIn for colleges and internship opportunities that would be available for you. 
studying abroad is probably the second most popular option. Um, usually students are going abroad during their junior year for the full semester. Again, you'll work with our study abroad office who will walk you through the application process. They'll help you figure out your geographic goals, your academic goals, any program that we're connecting you with, we guarantee that all of those credits are gonna transfer back. And so students who are going abroad will never be set back time-wise, they're still on track for that four-year graduation rate. We also have students able to bring in all of their scholarships, all of their need-based financial aid, your entire financial aid package is still in full force during that abroad semester. And so what you're able to do is then go abroad, have those scholarships, have that need-based aid still in full force. We never want cost to be the reason why a student was unable to pursue that abroad opportunity. Um, and then research is kind of the third of the big three in terms of XLP completion. It's very popular on our campus. There is not a discipline on campus that cannot be doing research. A lot of times when I speak with students, when I speak with families, they think, well, if I'm not a science major, maybe research isn't gonna be an opportunity for me. It absolutely is on our campus. We have um, philosophy students doing research. We have psychology students doing research on campus. You're working sometimes one-on-one -on -one with professors, usually as part of a research group. You're working with that professor. If that study is getting published, our students are published right along with it. They're able to present at regional and national conferences as a product of that research. And you can get into labs with professors as early as your first year on campus. Since we are undergraduate only, all of those research opportunities that might be going to graduate students at larger universities are reserved for those undergraduate students on our campus. Um, you can also fulfill the XLP through student research, or I'm sorry, through a creative project, through civic engagement, or through student teaching. Um, and so in those six ways, we're consistently building our students' resumes. And so when you're graduating from Rosinus, you don't only have a bachelor's degree from a top 100 liberal arts college, you have three semesters of an internship in Philadelphia. You study at the University of Auckland in New Zealand. You're able to become published and present at a national conference as a product of the research that you're doing. That is a much stronger resume. That's a much stronger application for our students coming out of college than if they were just coming out with that bachelor's degree. So we do believe firmly that it is a four year residential liberal arts experience. And so we have a housing requirement for students on our campus, but we also have a housing guarantee. We guarantee our students all four years of housing on our campus. We house all of our first year students together very intentionally to build that cohort of a first year class in our first year residence halls. After that, we have suite style housing available. We have a row of townhouses located right across the street from our campus, which offers a little bit more of a communal living situation. Um, some of these are broken down into what we call special interest housing. So these spent houses, as we call them, guarantee that you'll be living um, with students who share a common interest, a common passion, a common way of life. Um, and so maybe you are part of a, a greenhouse that's focused on environmental issues. Maybe you're part of a music house where musicians are able to come together and take part in that art form um, within that living community. Whatever it is, if you and a few friends want to propose a spit house, you're able to do that. Uh, you can actually have a rotating spit house year by year. Those are constantly changing to meet student demand. We have over 100 different clubs and organizations on campus. You name it, we pretty much have it already. But again, we're small, we're malleable. If you and three friends are able to come together and propose a club or organization, you can officially become a club. You need a faculty advisor and then you're eligible for funding through our Office of Student Life at that point. A little bit more formally, we have three interdisciplinary centers where students are able to engage and further those academic pursuits outside of the classroom. We have the Parley Center for Science and the Common Good where students are concerned with the intersectionality of the research they're doing in their science classrooms, but they also wanna know where does that meet society? How might we apply that to better the world around us? The Imagine Center for Integrative and Entrepreneurial Studies is teaching students from all disciplines to look at the world through that entrepreneurial lens to approach their problems to tackle their issues with that entrepreneurial mindset. And then the Melrose Center for Global and Civic Engagement is for students who are focused on political issues, on social justice issues, who are looking to make a difference and an impact on the world around them. We do have athletics for our students outside of the classroom as well. Um, about 37% of our students are competing in the varsity athletics. We are division three members of the Centennial Conference and those students are competing across 25 different varsity sports teams. Um, if you're not looking for that level of competition, about a third of our students take part in club or intramural sports. Um, so you can see that we certainly have a very active campus if that's something that you're looking for. We have plenty of options available for you. 
but by no means do you need to be an athlete um, to feel at home on our campus or to, to fit in or be a part of that or sign us campus community. A lot of what you're doing is going to take place on our campus, but we do have a number of attractions located nearby for students when they just need to get away a little bit um, and step away from campus and relax. And so we have the Providence Town Center. It's located about five minutes from our campus. And that's where you'll have uh, the closest kind of shopping center. There's a number of restaurants available for students. Um, there's a movie theater where you can go and just relax, step away from the classroom and blow off a little bit of steam together with your classmates. So that's very, very handy to campus. King of Prussia is about 15 minutes away. Um, it's home to the second largest mall in the country. And so if you're hope, looking for a more in-depth, intense shopping experience, might I suggest King of Prussia and the KOP Mall. Um, Philadelphia is right in our backyard. And I think that Philadelphia is something that makes Ursinus um, unique and different from some other CTCL schools is our proximity to that sixth largest metropolis in the country. It's about 40 minutes away from campus. And so for students who want to go in for internships, the city is available for you. Maybe you just want to go in for, the, for some fun on the weekends, see a concert, go to a game, check out a museum. Um, Philly is right there for you. Sometimes our student programming board will run trips to Philadelphia. Uh, they'll have discounted tickets to a 76ers game to provide transportation back and forth. And so while Philly is right there in our backyard, you are able to leave the city and return to our, our quieter residential liberal arts campus. And then for the outdoor enthusiasts, we do have the Perky Omen Trail. Um, the Perky Omen Trail connects to the Schuylkill River Trail, and so that can actually be used um, for biking all the way into the city of Philly. You can bike right from our campus, um, or for students who are looking to get out um, for a hike, for a run, whatever it might be, we do have the Perky Omen Trail connecting to the Schuylkill River Trail um, right off of our campus. Just there are more than 10, um, but we have them all, all 10 listed here, kind of the 10 largest. A couple of my favorites. Uh, the Berman Museum of Art is a fully functioning art museum right on our campus. Um, it's free entry for all students. And so we will have uh, professional art exhibits in there, but it's also a great way that students are able um, to exhibit some of their own art from their classrooms right in that formal exhibit setting. Biking to Philadelphia is part of the Schuylkill River Trail. Um, and then one of my personal favorite events each year is the Bear Bash, um, which is sort of a large um, concert that we'll do on campus. And it's obviously accompanied by a number of activities and things that are available for students. It's just a really, really fun weekend um, for students to kind of take a step back from academics and really enjoy the residential community and enjoy each other's company um, as they are members of our campus community. I mentioned our proximity to Philadelphia, um, and this, again, is a fantastic option for our students in terms of internships, in terms of jobs after they've graduated. One other unique program that we have is what we call the Philadelphia Experience, colloquially referred to as Philly X. And what students will do in the Philly X program is they will live for a semester in the city of Philadelphia. You will do a full-time internship. You see some of the organizations where our students have interned as a part of Philly X. During that semester, the full-time internship, you will take classes part-time on Drexel's campus. You also live on Drexel's campus, and you also have a number of courses available for you taught by our sinus faculty who will travel into the city um, and connect with our students and teach them on Drexel's campus as members of the Ursinus community. Um, and so we really have limitless opportunities for internships um, in areas like law, medicine, tech, media, nonprofits, um, the entire city is at your disposal. And each student is really able to customize that experience, make it their own, Functions a little bit like an abroad semester. You are away from campus for that whole semester, but again, you're only about 40 minutes off of campus. So if you want to come back for a weekend, connect with faculty, connect with your friends, you're able to do that very, very easily. Uh, and that is taking place every semester. We're sending anywhere between 15 to 20 students a semester uh, into Philadelphia as part of the Philly X program. And so all of these opportunities that we've discussed really work in concert with one another for some pretty strong outcomes for our students. 93% of our students are placed within six months of graduation. This means that they're employed full-time, doing a full-time graduate program, or doing a year of service. Again, we feel that our academic preparation, the four questions, the common intellectual experience, paired with that XLP requirement, and all of the one-on-one -on -one advising that our students are getting, really serve our students and prepare them for success once they've left your sinus. We have a 76% for your graduation rate, this compares very favorably to the average that's closer to 53%. Um, we are a top 100 national liberal arts college, according to the U.S. 
Research and World Reports. We have over 20,000 full-time jobs and internships, post-grad service opportunities available um, through that handshake program that I was talking about as well. And so you know that you're coming to our sinus. You know you're being set up for success to graduate within four years, and you're being set up for success with whatever that next step is going to be after graduation, be it full-time employment, um, full-time graduate school, or doing that year of service through Teach for America, Peace Corps, something like that. And just to recap a few of the things that make us unique, we are one of those 45 colleges that change lives. Um, we have a number of specialty scholarship opportunities that we'll touch on in just a few slides. Um, we have the Common Intellectual Experience, the Assignments Quest, we're asking you to grapple with those four questions. And then our XLP requirement on all of the individualized one-on-one -on -one advising and coaching that goes into that experience really set us apart from some other schools um, when students ask us, what makes your sinus unique? All right, so that's a very high level overview of the campus, both in and out of the classroom, some of the opportunities held therein. But I do wanna take this opportunity to transition our conversation um, into the application process, because of course you need to first apply before you can take advantage of everything that we have available on campus. So first and foremost, our application is free. We do not have any type of application fee. Um, and students are able to apply through the Common App or through the Coalition application. Um, and you can access both of those options right from our website or from those application platforms. We remember application rounds. I think it's really important for students to understand the difference in these application rounds. Um, so our most popular application round is early action. Early action deadline is November 1st. Early action is non-binding. Students are able to apply early action. You'll get your decision from us in mid-December, and then you are able to wait until the spring to ultimately make that decision. So you're able to carefully weigh, come to campus, um, and make sure that it is indeed the right choice for you to become a member of the Your Sinus community. I think early action is a great choice for students who on paper feel that their application um, at the beginning of their senior year accurately represents who they are as a student. You've done consistently well in ninth, 10th, 11th grade. You think that's who you are. You say, here, I want, I want you to take a look at me. This is who I am applying to your college. Anyone who feels that way, I strongly encourage you to apply early action. Again, it's non-binding. There really is no downside. Early decision is binding. And so students are only applying early decision to one school. It is your top choice institution. And you are going to have to sign that early decision agreement. And so students who know that our sinus is their number one choice, they want to lock in that decision. I strongly recommend applying early decision. We have two early decision rounds. Um, early decision one has a deadline of December 1st. Early decision two has a deadline of February 1st. Then we have regular decision. Regular decision is a good option for students who maybe moved a little bit late. Maybe you struggled in ninth grade, you turned it around in 10th grade, you're continuing that success in 11th grade and you want us to see that first semester of senior year. You want us to look at those grades, have that be a part of our decision. Those students are excellent candidates for regular decision. It allows you the extra time, the extra semester to build on that academic success, um, to add to your college application. That has a deadline of February 1st. Um, you would get your acceptance letter from us in mid-March and then you would have until later on that spring to make that decision. Um, so you might've noticed our early action, our regular decision, um, we have application deadlines and then we're releasing those acceptance letters together. Another benefit of an early decision is it's reviewed on a rolling basis. So if you know that we are your number one choice, you wanna lock in that decision, you can apply early decision and we will get you your um, admission decision within two weeks of that application submission. We also have transfer students applying um, for assignments. We review those on a rolling basis um, and we will review those as they come in. We have a two week turnaround time on those as well. We have a few required components of each student's application. So first and foremost, we require a student's transcript. Our average GPA of an incoming student is a 3.45. That's just an average. We have students well above that. We have students coming in below that average. That's simply just the average across all of our applications. We are looking at unweighted GPAs. So we wanna try and get students all on the same playing field just to get that kind of raw number. We are then though assigning what we call a strength of curriculum score. And that's where we bring a little bit of weighting into the process. And so if you're a student who has taken strictly a college preparatory curriculum, you will have a strength of curriculum score of a one. 
find college preparatory curriculums prepare you to succeed at the college level. But if you are a student who has chosen to challenge themselves, who's taking honors courses, AP courses, if you're enrolled in an, in an IB curriculum, uh, we want to honor that commitment that you made. We want, we want to give um, full credence to the extra time, care, the extra effort that you're putting in to that high school experience. And so if we're seeing that your transcript is full of honors courses, AP courses, whatever it might be, we'll give you a higher strength of curriculum score. And that's where we're able to bring a little bit of weighting into the process. We recognize that if you're taking a lot of AP courses, chances are you may have performed a little bit better in those courses if you weren't taking that high level of challenge and we want to pay homage where homage is due to you as the student with that strength of curriculum score. We also require a letter of recommendation from your counselor. If though you have a, a teacher, a mentor, someone who can really speak to who you are as a student and you think that that's going to add to your college application, we strongly encourage you to um, add those in. Don't feel like you can only submit that letter of recommendation from a counselor. If you think there's a teacher that can speak to who you are, who you're gonna be on our campus, that's someone that we want to hear from. We also require the personal essay um, as part of that common application process. I think the essay is a great opportunity for students to kind of jump off the page at a little bit of a three-dimensional element to their application. It's also the component of the application at this point that you as the student have the most control over. Um, your grades from ninth to 11th grade are already set. There's nothing you can do to change those. Your activities that you've done from ninth to 11th grade, those are already set as well. But what isn't set at this point is the essay. So I think it's something that students can really be careful with, take their time um, and think, what, what is the goal? What do I want to accomplish in this essay? What am I trying to communicate to the admission committee? Um, I think the students really want to have their own voice shine through in this personal essay. And again, it's your chance to talk directly to us, make sure that you're transmitting a message, um, a goal and outcome that you want the admission committee to know about you as a student and who you might be on our campus. So those are the requirements for first year incoming students. Um, for transfer students, it's not too different. We also require that personal essay. We need your high school transcript. We do though need your college transcript. And with transfer students, that's really what we're looking at. We wanna see how you've performed, how you've succeeded at that college level. Um, we need a student conduct verification form. We also need your course descriptions so that we can get you um, your transfer credit evaluation. So you know, okay, here's what I've done already at the college level. Here's where I will be at our science as a student. When I come in, in order to give you that TCE, we do need those course descriptions from you as a transfer student only. Those are the required application considerations. Optional application additions. Um, the number one optional component of your application are test scores. We are absolutely test optional. You do not need test scores to get any of our merit-based scholarships that we'll talk about in a couple of slides. If you are submitting test scores, here are our averages. Our average SAT is a 1230, average ACT is a 27. We will super score. Um, and so test scores, I always tell students only exercise that option if it's going to strengthen your application. Um, if you have any questions about that, I think the easiest thing to do is reach out directly to your admission counselor. We can walk you through that process. Um, and if you really just can't decide, you can tell us your test scores. Um, and we'll, we'll kind of look at them informally and say if we think that you should submit those or not. It's only once you formally submitted them through the college board or through your college counselor um, that we must take those into consideration. So it's certainly something for you to think through um, and exercise that optionality if it is going to strengthen your application. We would love to get those test scores from you. We also have an optional Y or Sinus essay. It's part of our supplement. It's not as in-depth as that personal essay on the common application. It's really designed for us to be able to get to know you as a student and see what it is about our sinus that speaks to you, that calls to you, that makes you think that you would be a great fit on our campus and indeed that our campus would be a great fit for you. We also have interviews. Um, I describe our interviews as encouraged, but certainly not required. And again, that's a great opportunity for us to get to know you a little bit better, but it's also a good chance for you as the student to get to know us a little bit better. And so we love when students come to those interviews prepared to answer questions, but also prepared um, with questions of their own to ask of us. And what we're doing throughout this entire process is we're trying to get to know you. Again, we're small. We have about 1,500 total students on our campus. Every single person that we're adding is a valued member of that campus community. And so through your activities, through your essay, through your transcript, your test scores, if you do submit those, we wanna to get to know who you are as a student and we're ultimately trying to answer the question of, 
can this student be a successful community member in and out of the classroom on our campus at Ursinus. Once you complete that application process, um, we then obviously come to the financial assistance portion of the conversation. Um, and at Ursinus, we firmly believe that private is possible. 99% of our students receive some form of financial assistance that comes in a couple of ways. Um, so the first way that students can receive financial assistance um, would be need-based. In order to qualify for need-based aid, we do need you to complete the FAFSA. Some schools will require something called a CSS profile. We do not, we are FAFSA only. It's available starting October 1st. I encourage every student who's applying to Rosinus to complete the FAFSA. You never know what you're going to get back from that FAFSA. And again, if you don't complete it, you are not eligible for need-based aid. So that is the one and only requirement um, that opens you up for eligibility for need-based aid. And then that is based off of um, the EFC, the estimated family contribution as a product of that FAFSA. Merit scholarships are automatically applied to every applicant. So you do not need to apply for any of these merit-based scholarships that you see listed here. As I'm reviewing your application, I'm going through and seeing which of these scholarships you are going to qualify for. And obviously we want to qualify you for the largest scholarship that we are able to do so based upon your academic credentials. So these range um, from 21 up to $40,000. The Zacharias Honor Scholarship is reserved for about the top 5% of our incoming class. So these are some extremely strong students. We recognize the success you've had in high school. Um, we wanna give you a merit scholarship in kind that recognizes that success in the same way. Our Gateway Scholarship um, has changed a little bit this year. So if anyone has been to one of our information sessions in the past, um, make sure you pay very careful attention here. The Gateway Scholarship, students are able to qualify for that now in three ways. Um, the first way is through test scores. So if you have a 1250 on the SAT, that's fantastic. You are able to qualify automatically for that Gateway Scholarship. Second way is through the ACT. If you have a 28 on the ACT, you know that you will automatically qualify for that Gateway Scholarship. So 1250 on the SAT, 28 for the, on the ACT, you know that you will be getting that Gateway Scholarship. Students who do not submit test scores um, or who are just simply just focused more on the GPA, do a 3.85 unweighted GPA, you will automatically qualify for the Gateway Scholarship. So if on your transcript you have a 3.9 GPA, you know upon time of application that you're going to qualify for the gateway. And again, that is an unweighted figure. Students with a 3.5 to 3.84 who have taken a more rigorous curriculum will be considered for the gateway scholarship on a case-by-case -case basis. So we're looking at those students. We're looking at the level of depth um, and strength of curriculum that you've put into your four years of college. And if we think that you still have a very, very strong GPA, but it's just a little bit below that 3.85. Due to that level of challenge, we do want to honor that effort that you put in with that Gateway Scholarship as well. The Reverend Rice Memorial Scholarship is for students who have meaningfully impacted issues of diversity in their communities, either in or out of school. And we're looking at students' activities. We're looking at essays. We're looking at letters of recommendation um, to qualify students for that Reverend Rice Memorial Scholarship during our review process. And then our assignment scholarships um, range from 21 up to $30,000, and those look at your strength of curriculum, your GPA, and your test scores, if and only if you're submitting those, um, and you would fall into somewhere in the range right there. For transfer students, you're also eligible for merit scholarships um, based on your um, GPA, your strength of curriculum score, and then any transfer scholars who are members of the Phi Theta Kappa Honor Society, you know that you will automatically qualify for a $30,000 scholarship. Again, all of these, what we call merit-based scholarships, are automatically considered when you apply to Rosinus. On top of those merit scholarships, we have a number of specialty scholarships. All the scholarships listed here do require outside application. A number of these are able to go um, on top of your merit scholarship, and that's what we call stackable. And I think the easiest way for students to understand stackable scholarship is to simply look at the amount. So you can see here, um, our scholarships that are worth $40,000 per year, the creative writing, the performing arts scholarships, one in each of dance, music, and theater, those will replace your merit scholarship. There are very large amounts, $40,000 per year, that is going to supplant what you already have in terms of merit aid. Um, but coming in at $40,000, chances are that is going to be a larger scholarship for you. So I would encourage any students out there who are interested in creative writing, uh, who are active in the performing arts, to go online and apply for those scholarships. All of these applications are gonna be available starting set first. These smaller dollar amounts that you see down here, um, the 10 down to the 5,000, 
those are all able to be stacked on top of that merit area. And these are all focused around an area of interest. Um, the Parley Fellows are focused on, we talked about the Parley Center for Science and the Common Good earlier. Parley Fellows wanna come in and be intimately involved with that center right from day one on campus. You lead scholars are for students who are focused on um, leadership issues. Um, we have Smith Quest scholarships for students who are coming in hoping to broaden their spiritual life and make that a part of their four-year journey on campus. Social justice scholars are focused on impacting social justice issues. Whatever it might be, we've designed these scholarships to allow you to pursue that right from day one on our campus. And so not only are you able to get extra um, scholarship money on top of your merit aid, but you're able to connect with a cohort of students who share that passion and who you know that you will be a part of right from day one on our campus. So you can check all of these out at ursinus.edu forward slash opportunity. Um, again, you need to apply for these scholarships. First, you will apply to Ursinus. You will use those login credentials to access all of these applications. Students can apply for a maximum of two of these specialty scholarships, and those are all, again, available starting September 1st. All right, so what's next? Um, our application is now open as of August 1st. You can apply, again, for free on the Common App Coalition application. Transfers are able to apply on a rolling basis, so if you're looking to come in um, in, the, in the fall and the spring, you can check out that application right online. We have more upcoming events where you're able to interact with us um, virtually through our Workshop Wednesday series, where we walk through different parts of the college application process. Check all of those out online. We do have our large fall open house coming up on October 24th that is going to be virtual. Um, that's really our largest kind of one-stop shop for you to get a true sense of what it might be like to be a student on our campus at Ursinus. We do um, virtual one-on-one -on -one interactions with admission counselors. We also do have in-person visits on our campus. Those are also one-on-one. -on -one. Um, visitors are required to wear masks. We are doing those socially distanced outside when available. Uh, but if you do want to get on campus, if you want to take part in that in-person experience, we are offering that for you. Um, and then I always encourage students to reach out to their admission counselor. You can find those folks right online. We are broken down geographically. Um, so if you have any questions on who your admission counselor might be, definitely check out our website. So thank you so much for listening to our presentation. Um, and I'm going to try to answer as many questions as I can. I know that we're running a little bit short on time but I do want to get to those questions. And if I'm not able to, my contact information is right here, or you can email admission at ursinus.edu, and we'll get all those questions answered for you. All right, so I see the first question coming in um, from Malia, and Malia asks, is there a pre-dental program? Great question. Um, so the short answer is yes, there is. We have a number of what we call pre-professional programs. So those could be um, pre-med, pre-dental, pre-health, pre-law, pre-engineering, whatever it might be, those serve as what we, what we refer to as a, a minor on campus. And so if you're coming in, you know you wanna go into pre-dental, you would have a pre-health minor. So you're majoring in biology. You'd work through your biology coursework, you'd have your biology advisor who's making sure that you're gonna be successful in that biology program. Your pre-health advisor is making sure that everything you're doing on campus is gonna complement your goal of getting into dental school. So you have a separate advisor, whose sole focus is getting you into dental school. So making sure that you are connecting with research opportunities on campus. They're making sure that you're connecting with internship opportunities that you might have available. They're helping you find dental schools. They're walking you through that dental school application process. And that's true across the board for all of these pre-professional programs. Um, so we do indeed have those pre-professional programs. You have a separate dedicated advisor and they function um, in the same way as, as a minor would function on our campus. Uh, what are classes looking like this semester with COVID? Thank you, Danielle. A great question, a pertinent question, a timely question. We have a few different options for students. So we are committed to offering students um, a full residential experience on campus if they would like. Obviously, that residential experience is coming um, with a number of modifiers, as you, as you might find from a, a quote unquote normal semester on campus. But if students are looking for that on-campus experience, it is there for them. Students who don't want to partake in that, though, are able to take classes 100% online. It's entirely up to the student. Um, we, have, we have faculty who are teaching um, both in the classroom and online. And then any faculty who are teaching in the classroom, those are gonna be broadcast out to those online students. Um, so classes look a little bit differently depending on who the student might be. And that is entirely up to the student and what they are mo most comfortable with 
we obviously completely understand anyone who may have concerns around that. Um, okay, so I've got a question here. If I have an SAT score higher than 1250, but my SAT score is lower than 28, will I still receive a scholarship? Good question. Yes, you would. So you only need to meet one of those criteria. So for the Gateway Scholarship, again, it's a 1250 SAT, 28 ACT, or a 3.85 GPA. If you're meeting any one of those three, then you would qualify for that scholarship. It's a great question. You can definitely see where that could get a little bit confusing. Um, Fabiana asks, are students able to get more than one merit scholarship? No. So you're only able to get the one merit scholarship. Those are automatically applied when you're applying to Ursinus. You are able though then um, able to apply for those specialty scholarships that might be able to get stacked on top of that. So if you're qualifying, um, let's say you qualify for the $35,000 Gateway Scholarship, that's great. You apply for our ULEAD scholarship of $8,000. You're then able to stack that on top. So your total scholarship is going to be $43,000, 35 of that coming from Gateway, and then eight of that coming from that ULEAD scholarship. But it is only the one merit scholarship that you're able to get. Um, Wallace asks, what is dining like? So dining is excellent. We have our Wismer Dining Hall, which is our main dining hall on campus constantly rotating options for students in that dining hall. Um, I know that staff members who have the opportunity to eat wherever we would like, we're constantly going to the dining hall for lunch during the day when we're on campus. Um, but you have your traditional, you know, your sandwiches, your grill station um, for, for burgers and things like that. There's a constantly rotating um, international station. Um, there is a health food section that's focused more on vegan options. We have the salad bar that's constantly functioning. It rotates every single day, so you're not going to get bored. There's constantly variety, and it is very, very high-quality food. We then have um, what we call Lower Wismer, which is more of a, a quicker grab-and-go option. Um, down there, we have um, the grill options, again, available. There's the sandwich station. Uh, we have burritos. We have tacos available for students. Um, there's um, Jasmine's, which is more of like a coffee shop atmosphere. You are able to use your dining plan in Lower Wismer as well as Upper Wismer. Um, and then we also have in the Athletic Center on campus, um, we do have a smoothie station, a health food station for a salad or something like that. So you get done working out, you can come out, grab a protein smoothie, head to class, um, and get you through that opportunity very, very quickly. Uh, Wallace asked, how many students participate in Greek life? Great question. So we do have Greek life on campus. About 20% of our students are involved in Greek life on campus, um, but we don't have any Greek only housing. And so I think that's a very important distinction to make. We believe firmly that students on our campus are members of that or sinus community first and foremost. We find that when students are um, living as members of Greek organizations, sometimes that community can, can kind of take precedent and so we don't want that. We want you to be a member of your science community first and foremost. And then if you want to be a member of that Greek organization after that, you are able to do so. So about 20% of students take part in Greek like, Greek like on campus. Um, numbers of fundraisers, social events, and things like that are available for you. But we do not have any Greek housing on campus. Can non-majors participate in dance? Absolutely. So we do have majors on campus for music, for theater, for dance but you do not need to be a major to take part in any of um, the opportunities for performance held within those majors. And so we have um, an Ursinus dance company. We have an Ursinus dance team. Um, they're constantly putting on shows. These are open audition. You do not need a dance, to be a dance major to take part in any of those. For theater, um, we're putting on at least two productions each semester. Those are all open audition as well. And so if you want to be health and exercise physiology major, but you love theater, you want to keep that going, one audition for those programs, you can absolutely do that. For music, we have a number of different groups on campus, um, from strings to concert band to acapella groups, whatever it is, those are available to students across campus, regardless of major. Josh asks, are merit scholarships for the first year or for all four years? Great question, Josh. I, sh I should have mentioned that all of those merit scholarships are in force for all four years. And so if you're getting that $35,000 gateway scholarship, that's $35,000 in your first year, in your second year, in your third year, and in your fourth year. The specialty scholarships as well are renewable. And so if you are getting the gateway, 
stacking it with the social justice scholarship, you know that you're going to have that $43,000 of scholarship money for all four years, provided you keep up a strong um, level of academics. And so students simply need to just maintain that 2.0 GPA in order to stay qualified for all of that. Um, and so thank you so much for all of the questions. I see that I wasn't able to get to a, a good number of them, and I do apologize for that, but I know that we're on a very strict schedule here this afternoon. Um, so thank you very much to Zach and, and StriveScan for hosting us. Thank you all for taking part in our conversation here this morning. We look forward to interacting with you on our website, um, virtually or in person on our campus. And as always, go Bears. Thank you so much. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much, Sam. I'll send you a transcript of all the questions submitted. So if you didn't get to them, uh, he will have access to them as well. Students and counselors, thanks for tuning in to this session. As you close this window, a very quick four question survey will appear. We ask for your feedback. We encourage you to check out the upcoming CTCL programming and the recordings all at strivescan.com slash virtual slash CTCL. Thanks everyone. Have a great day.